right, so I want to say uh, I want to be mindful of people's time. I know uh, for those of you who are here on time, that's great. They might have a few people still joining us, and that's also great. We want to have as many people as possible. Um, and so I'll start by saying, um, Welcome. Uh, my name is Maritza Munson, and I work here at College of the Canyons, and this is our third international forum on youth. This year, we're doing a forum on global transition topics. Mm -hmm. uh, the first year was, um, the theme was identity. Our second year, the theme was migration. And we said this year we're doing transition and it's very broad topic because we want to bring in broad perspectives. And to be honest, when the group started planning these events, we didn't know the world was going to transition so much in the last year, year and a half. Uh, but here we are, we're trying to learn different perspectives. Earlier today, we had a keynote address from our chancellor, Dr. Diane Van Hook, which was great. We had, uh, that was in person. So we're also having some in-person events. Uh, and the rest of the week will have virtual events. So if you are joining on now with this link at this time, know that there's the rest of the week will have other events as well with the same link. And um, uh, if you're here at this time, then maybe you can come by our other times. We have uh, tomorrow, we have a speaker from Nepal who will be talking about mentoring learners beyond the formal, that's a topic. Um, on Wednesday at the same time, we have a speaker, uh, Dr. Mark Hamill, that will be talking about the next generation in Vietnam. And on Thursday at the same time, we'll invite back all of our speakers from the week to talk about their perspectives. We have a whole speaker panel. And right before that, we'll actually get a chance to talk to students. So we'll have a student panel first, get their perspectives on what's coming up next, what, what the, the thoughts are on global transition topics. And then we'll ask the same questions that we'll ask the, the students to our panelists throughout the week. So we'll get that different perspective on how to move forward. And so today, I'm very excited about this event, um, just because I am a self-proclaimed foodie. So I love international education and food, I think are my two greatest passions. And so having have the opportunity to host an event like this, I think is great to see how food culture and just even the LA area, how, how lucky we are to have this diverse set of food around us. And so if you got a chance, uh, you saw hopefully in the invite that I had a link to the Migrant Kitchen. And then I linked it to a one hour special. They have multiple episodes, but I wanna talk about what that is and why we chose it. Um, so the Migrant Kitchen is through KCET or PBS um, series that's award-winning series about food in Los Angeles. What well, started, I should say, it started with food in Los Angeles and the diversity that the immigrant communities bring to this area. And just the different types of people you see behind the, the kitchen that are, are feeding the people here in LA. And of course, now the, they've been so popular, it expanded. So now you see different episodes that are about 30 minutes long or so, some in the Bay Area, and they're slowly branching out. And of course, in the last year, year and a half, I know, well, I think everyone has seen that the food industry has changed a lot. And I wanted to not only show you these clips from, or a, clips from the one hour special, we won't see the whole thing, just a few clips, um, but also talk about, um, or get to talk to people in the industry now, what's happening. And so we have um, Chef Cindy here with us and um, in, like 30 minutes or so, we'll have uh, another chef, Chef Michelle, joining us. To talk about her perspectives in the field as well. And so I'll start with um, Chef Cindy. Would you be able to please introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, and what um, We want to know, you know, a little bit about who you are, what you do, and of course, what kind of chef are you? Thank you, Maritza. Thank you for having me on. And hello to everybody. Um, so I am actually, uh, I'm an instructor. Um, I am a department chair for the Culinary Arts and Wine Studies Program here at COC. We have a fabulous $8 million facility with four kitchens, a wine study room, a wine cellar, a cafe. And um, I come from a background of baking and pastry. So um, that's my first love. I started when I was 15 in the kitchen frying donuts um, for a very long time. And I just fell in love with sugar. And so, um, 
I've been working in the kitchen uh, ever since I was 15. I've never had another job um, except for in the kitchen. And it's a passion because it's a lot of work working in kitchens and um, you have to be passionate about it. And um, that's what we try to, to teach our students here is, you know, a lot of them come in uh, with passion about the food where they're from, their food culture. They want to explore food. And that's what the Culinary Institute is all about. So um, I've been uh, teaching now here for about 15 years. Uh, like I said, I come from baking and pastry. I did get my culinary degree, so I do go on the savory side every once in a while. But um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to pay it forward to all the students now. And we have such a mix of students. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, we all learn from each other. And so this is such a great topic, the migrant kitchen, because that's what it is now. It's not when I started, you know, 30 some odd years ago. Um, it's very different now uh, where everybody is cooking. You're just not a dishwasher anymore, or you're not the janitor anymore. You're not the prep cook. Now anybody can be the chef and everybody is open to it. So it's great times and um, it's a great topic. So thank you, Maritza, for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Of course, we want to know the, the educators of our future cooks and chefs uh, all over uh, this area and maybe wherever they move. Um, I can tell you that uh, we, me and my partner have doubled in cooking. <laughs> like we cook a lot at home and right before the pandemic, we were like, what if we cook maybe on the weekends? Uh, I, we, uh, just a side note, <laughs> it was like we dug a hole in my parents' backyard and we're like, we'll do barbacoa on Sunday. And of course then the pandemic hit. So it's just, so we do barbacoa is for us, but it's still something that's kind of like in the back of our heads. Like maybe someday we'll do something on the weekends on the side. Right. Uh, it's, it's such, I mean, everyone needs to eat, right? So, right. And everyone loves good food. And so it's like, there's those that appreciate the art that goes into making food. The one like you do here at the um, IQ. So I know like I love going whenever there's a chance to go and see what your students are doing. Right. It's also just getting to see what others are doing with their own backwards. And I think that's <laughs> what we'll see a little bit in some of these clips. And so with that, I'll start. Um, the next clip is two minutes a clip, and it's, it's a kind of the intro and a little overview of what this uh, show does. Uh, it's the, the Migrant Kitchen. So let me bring that up now. Los Angeles from the early 20th century all the way till today is a city defined by immigrants arriving here in wave after wave. We're a city of immigrants. And the waves of migration that arrived here correspond to historical moments of great upheaval, particularly from the East, from Asia, and from the South, from Latin America. Refugees from El Salvador, from Mexico, China, Vietnam, so those kinds of journeys, those kinds of migrations are, are very Los Angelino. It's productive in terms of the economy and it's also creative because yeah, people are trying to do good business and to do good business to get customers, you have to be creative. And oftentimes, uh, of course, that happens on, on the level of, of culture itself. Fusion cuisine is nothing more and nothing less than the story of immigrants bumping into each other on the street in Los Angeles. So stuff starts to shift culturally in all kinds of different ways. People start learning the language, that starts to shift. It's not just the immigrants that are changed, the immigrants are changing the natives too. And you can literally track a people's history and the history of a city through these waves and the culture they're bringing from the old country how it's transformed here, and how it transforms the whole. And that's how great cities are made. Okay, so one of the things I love about that clip is 
it's it's just a little bit of an overview, but it talks about just you know the diversity that we have here in LA. And so I think my my first question, oh, the clip is called the convergence of cultures shaping great cities. So one of the things whenever we um, recruit international students to come is I always say you know this is a great place to be even if you uh, are looking for just the American culture, but you can find other cultures. Like there's a uh, little Tokyo, there's a, uh, I live right by like Thai town. There's like immigrant communities that are making food for that community. And so you can really have an authentic experience uh, as well as, you know, third, fourth generation of those chefs that come from those backgrounds, but then they're kind of reshaping. And so there's all kinds of different levels of food in LA. And so for um, Chef Cindy, my first question would to you would be like how do you define uh, LA food culture you you know you've been in this street you said all oh, most of your your life now or like your uh, career so I want to know like and you've been in this area and you are teaching our future students so how do you define LA food culture you know um and, and that's a great question I define it as complex because, um, you know, you have Mexican food on one block, you have Thai on the other block, you have Asian on another block, and um, it's quite a melting pot here now. And I think that the food trucks really helped um, some of that migration come to fruition because um, people are so open to it now. And a food truck is a great way. You don't need to brick and mortar. You don't need to spend $500,000, you know, to get your food out there. And it was also an opportunity for people to try different types of food and, and different cultures. And um, you had people with a lot of passion, you still do, about their food culture and about you know, where they're from. And everybody has a food history. Yes, everybody has a food story, whether it's from their grandma, from their nana, from their you know, dad, or, and, and that is what you know, moves it forward. And that's what gives people that passion and they feel connected to their food. And of course, you know, we're in hospitality, so we like to share that and that's sharing the love. So I would call it complex. You know, um, it's just now starting to um, come back to life uh, due to the pandemic. It certainly has changed quite a bit, um, but it's now just coming back to life. And I urge everybody to go to Grand Central Market in LA. It's such a great melting pot and to try different cuisines and different spices. And uh, it's really a great place to go. And I had to mention that's one of the, it won't be a part that we'll watch today, but this hour long special focuses on the Grand Central Market. Uh, one family that's uh, been there a couple of generations. And I think that kind of market, I know I've seen abroad. Um, when I go to like Mexico, for example, that's like every community has their mercado and yes. that's where you go and you find it's like, it's a farmer's market, but it's indoors. Yes. And so now of course we have here the same thing, but um, that's really, I think how that market has changed is also a reflection of how the city is probably changing as well. Cause now that you don't just have like the, the dried goods and the, like the market kind of stuff, you also have the kind of fancier stalls and yeah. a little bit from all over the world, I feel like I, whenever mm -hmm. I go down there. It's one of my favorite places. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Sure. My, my next question, as far as like, um, like influence in the city, how it's influenced you, it's like how have food cultures or maybe a techniques from outside your own culture has influenced your cooking? Um, uh, yeah, moving forward. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I want to share a story with you. So we have um, an instructor and um, she's Asian and she's great. And she brings a lot of flavors um, into her, her baked goods. And, um, you know, we experiment uh, with all different flavors and we just made a kimchi croissant and it was fabulous. And you wouldn't even think about it, but the fermentation, you know, and, and the spiciness of it. Um, brought such a great flavor to that uh, croissant. So it's really fun that we get to play with our food and play with different spices. And here, students who come from all different cultures, from all over, share their experience and say, hey, chef, maybe we should try, you know, a little anise in this. You know, we use it a lot in, in my cooking at home. And so we get to experiment that way. And uh, we're open to that. And 
all of the students learn from each other, which is really great too. So they're open to trying new and different things. And we encourage that, you know, everybody tastes everything. So, um, you know, and it ever evolves, you know, one day it could be kimchi and the next day, you know, it's chocolate from Mexico that we're tasting. So um, it's really great. And we're very fortunate here to be able to do that right here in Santa Clarita, right? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. As a, as a follow up to that, is, um, I want to ask in your teaching, I know you have to like plan out your semester, like mm-hmm. um, how does the different cultures that maybe like one one semester affect the next one? Like, have you do you have any examples of like? Yes. Yeah, so um, in our curriculum, we have an international class. And so the international class only cooks food from uh, we have Africa. We go to Thailand they go to Spain. Of course, they go to France. And so each week they tackle a different country and learn about the spices from there. And we try to um, bring ingredients from uh, that country if we can. If we can't bring in the ingredients, we certainly bring in the technique of cooking, right? Uh, Of course, in my area of expertise, baking and pastry, everything is from France, right? Because French think that they're the best baking and pastry people. And they are, they're very good. Uh, But there's other techniques also that we learn, so. But the international class, is always a favorite with all the students. Oh, yeah, that sounds fun. I don't think I've seen it and now I kind of want to take it. <laughs> <laughs> you can take it. <laughs> I always have issues with uh, like gluten allergies. So I'm like, ah, but I still learn technique, I'm sure. Which would Yeah, be and we address that too now. You know, that's a, that's a great um, point is that never before have I seen so many people with gluten allergies or nut allergies or... Um, dairy allergies. And so vegan is very big now. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of people are not eating meat or being plant-based. Is it a trend? I don't know. I think it's here to stay, Um, but we're adjusting our curriculum for that too. Uh, We've um, uh, covered, you know, uh, healthy living and, and uh, vegan food. So the students are also learning that now because you have to have that if you're opening a restaurant or a food truck, or you have to have something alternative on your menu, uh, whether it be plant-based or, um, you know, a meat substitute. I've seen that, yeah, definitely more and more. Um, I knew a few years back, even just, if you were a vegetarian or vegan, it was like, you got the salad and that's it. And exactly. I, I know they have the alternative menus are like, this is what's safe. Like if I've gotten the gluten menus and I'm like, oh, thank you. It's like, it, it takes the guesswork out of trying to figure out what to eat and make sure that you don't accidentally fall on some landmines, you know, gut landmines <laughs> in my case. But thank you very much for that. So the that, that first part I wanted to really just said, talk about the city, talk about your influence over the city. Next, um, this next clip is more of the chef's journey. So we'll take a, a look at um, the clip, a couple of people that talk about their journey in the industry, and then we'll have a couple of follow-up questions for that. And then hopefully by then, I think um, our other chef uh, will be able to join us. So uh, let me get that started. I'm more than happy to take questions too, Maritza. Oh, okay, okay. That's what I was going to say. Well, if you have questions as well, please put them in the chat now before I put on the clip. And now we can address them so it can be more interactive as well. Oh, I think I forgot to click. Yeah, there we go. Alvin Kailan, he had always had an ambition to want to then open up a, a ramen spot. Uh, that's how we ended up in Chinatown initially, was when he opened up Ramen Champ, I think about maybe two years ago. And then since then, he has Unit 120, he has Amboy, which is a, a Filipino barbecue stand that's operated also in Far East Plaza. I think he's very much part of this wave of younger 20, 30 something, um, second generation Asian American entrepreneurs who uh, see Chinatown as a real opportunity to be able to test out um, new concepts and new ideas. Unit 120 is a, is a kitchen incubator. It's for people to try their ideas out and pass or fail. So, I mean, that, that's how it all started, was just like really being able to be a platform for people to jump off. And like, 
there's people who failed. It's better that they just wasted a thousand dollars than building a five hundred thousand dollar restaurant, and realizing, oh shit, I'm not, I don't have the gusto for this. He came up to us and was like, "Yo, I've been trying to come to Lhasa for a minute." Um, back when we were doing monthly dinners, we'd sell out all the time because it was just once a month, 120 people a night. He came to a dinner finally and loved it and then offered us to be his first residence here at Unit 120. And I ate their food and I was, I, I, I was really taken back. I was like, wow, these guys are the truth. Like they know what they're doing. And I kind of felt like how, how I felt like when I first started Excellent. And I was just like, oh man, these guys have something special. They were our first incubation project here at Unit 120, and they're doing well. I mean, like, packed house every weekend, and now they're in talks to open a restaurant. And that's like the dream. That was what we set out to do six months ago. Elvin has given us opportunity. It's uh, his way of investing in us. Um, giving us this chance and just a bigger stage, you know? Three days a week instead of one day a month. Um, it's a lot, you know, we were able to do this full time until we open a restaurant. And it's working, it's working. I think what we're creating is essentially Filipino Californian food. You know, we're, we're finding the bounty that we have here and integrating it into the, the food and the flavor profiles of our memories. Uh, growing up, eating Filipino food. It was this nice, sweet place that we're trying to go with Lhasa, where we're making American produce taste Filipino. Isa is probably the best pastry chef in LA. I had her dessert at, at Orsa and Winston, and it blew my mind. And I was like, she's Filipino? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, oh my God, we're like, we've come up, <laughs> you know? My parents, they really wanted to fit into society, which is very common for immigrant families. So I actually don't speak the language. Um, I was told speak English. But if anything, I always had the food and I always grew up eating that. And that was always the, the main connection to my culture. So when she left Joseph Centeno, she was here, and I was just trying to bring her creativity out. I was just like, I mean, Dominique Ansel has the, the corona. I was like, what are you going to do? I was like, this is your time. You're, you're not working for a chef. You're in between jobs. What's your, what, what can you pull off? You know, like, what can you do? When I went to the Philippines, I wasn't sure if I was going to be inspired to do any kinds of desserts. And then when I got back into the country, got over my jet lag, I was like, I need to do some work. We had an event here at Unit 120, which was the Chinatown After Dark. And then somebody's just like, well, why don't you make something kind of like Filipino? And I really, I had never made anything specifically Filipino inspired before. So I created malas, which is a hybrid Filipino donut crossed between a malasada, which is a Hawaiian donut, and carioca, which is a Filipino fritter, and it's coated in latik, which is caramelized coconut milk. Stop that clip there. I know we're probably all getting very hungry now. <laughs> that looks delicious. Uh, every time I see that, I'm like, oh, I wish I didn't have that. Uh, but I, the, the one reason that I picked this clip was because they talk about different ways in which chefs can get started. You know, the Unit 120 is a place like you were talking about, Cindy, that um, chefs can kind of test out their ideas before they, you know, open a brick and mortar to make sure that this is something they really want. And for me, I wanted to find out. Um, Oh, and we do have Michelle. Michelle's uh, able to log on. Um, so I think, let me, uh, Michelle, are you there? 
I am. Hi. I'm so sorry. <laughs> How okay. How's everybody? Thank you. Thank you for joining. Okay. So I think um, that's, I'll have you introduce yourself and then we can go. Uh, We'll continue with the question. So I wanted to ask you um, just a little bit about yourself, what you're doing now, and what kind of chef are you? Oh, I love that question. What kind of chef are you? Yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Michelle. I own Chef Michelle and Company. We are a zero waste uh, farm to table catering company located in downtown Los Angeles. And when it comes to what kind of chef I am, I would say that I am a steward. And I'm a steward of the land. And what that really means is respecting not only the product as, you know, greens and uh, proteins um, from animals and non-animals, but just really like stewardship towards the land and taking care of it and cooking in a respectful way so that I can guarantee that there will be plenty for others behind me through gener generational education and just passing down traditions and knowledge. Okay. And that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before um, you logged on, we, I also asked um, Chef Cindy, which I think I'll ask you as well since you're on now. It's, um, one is how do you define Los Angeles food culture and have you had any influence from other cultures or, you know, techniques from outside your own culture that have influenced your cooking? Oh, a hundred percent. Um, as far as technique is concerned. So I'm first generation Salvadoran and we would go to El Salvador every summer. I would say from nine ish years old to about 15 years old. So about three months out of the year, we'd be in El Salvador, which is all, you know, um, when you're going back home, it's all farms and you're making everything from scratch and you're milking cows and, you know, you're slaughtering chickens and literally it's like, you're doing everything. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a natural zero waste lifestyle, which I didn't even know was zero waste. I mean, that was just the way that uh, we lived. So, um, having that as my basis, um, you know, bleeds into everything. I went to a French culinary school and am classically French trained. Um, so, I mean, that right there. So I'm French trained, but uh, my basis is in Salvadoran cuisine because that is my home style cooking. Um, but also through my travels, um, I liaise for the country of Mexico to other um, countries. So I'm very fortunate to go to Mexico about three times a year mm -hmm. and meet different chefs from different states in Mexico and learn uh, Puebla style cuisine or Yucca style cuisine. And, you know, everyone has their own techniques. And that's the wonderful thing about food is that you can, you know, travel and meet different chefs from different parts of the world and learn their techniques and then bleed them into what it is that you're making um but mainly i would say it is french um because that's just my basis mm -hmm. um and salvadoran because that's how i was raised are the two biggest um standout techniques in my food 100 percent um could you repeat the first question please it's uh the first one was uh how do you define la food culture uh that's a toughie. I mean, I really feel like LA food culture is a melting pot. And I hate to say it because it sounds so cliche, like a melting pot, but it really, really is. I think California itself is home to so many first generation people from so many different cultures that because we are born here in California, uh, we have, we're fortunate to have all this great produce and proteins. Um, and then the culture that we're brought up with, with whatever it may be and everybody else's, you know, like I'm, like I said, I'm Salvadorian and born and raised in the suburbs of LA. Um, my school was mostly Mexican and Asian and in my city around me, you know, I have a little Filipino town, I have a little Tokyo town, and I have a little Armenian contingency. So, you know, all these little places, they all have their own street food. They all have their own, you know, chefs. 
And the older I get, the more I see more first generation people combining different cuisines together and techniques. So I feel it really is a melting pot of flavors. Yes, I, I would I would definitely agree. And it just reminded me because uh, Chef Cindy was also talking about like food trucks. And I remember I had a friend visit from Mexico City and I was like, oh, we're going to go have some like Korean tacos. He was like, what? Korean tacos? Like, yes, like that, that's a thing here now. You know, it's like then I, th- I see a little bit more of that or like this clip that we just saw that it was a hybrid Filipino Hawaiian donut. And so it's like those kind of awesome creations that are coming out from um, like the show says, it's like people talking to each other, living next to each other. You get exposed to different ways of doing things. And, and going back to, to the clip we just saw, I wanted to highlight again that this is, I, I picked this clip because it highlights kind of the Jeff's journey, like where um, you can start. And they talk about having these like incubator kitchens where you can have maybe one night a month or, you know, and launch yourself off that way to see if you are, are successful. And the, the guy that was talking at the beginning, oh, I can't remember his name now, but he, um, he owns uh, Exlet, which I know was a food truck downtown and then blew up and now has a stand in um, the uh, Mercado downtown, um, yep. the market. And then I, we recently, I was looking him up or looking up the website and now he's got Exlet in different parts of the world as well. So he's really from a food truck, he blew up all over the place. And now he's also bringing that opportunity to other chefs to try to figure out what are you good at? Here's a space, maybe you have one week or every other week or something to showcase what you do. And so with that in mind, I wanna ask you, what opportunities did you take advantage of in your journey to get where you are now? Um, Every opportunity. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, in culinary school, um, I was the youngest in class. I was the only student that was 18. I went to culinary school right out of high school. And most of the people in my class were like 35 and up. And a lot of them were in there, you know, just to get their certificate or their boss sent them or, you know, they had a life career change situation. Um, So I was very lucky to be cooking with an older generation and learning from them. But also, you know, being in a French culinary school was amazing because all of the chefs were like, you know, from top notch schools and like the best restaurants. So, you know, taking advantage of the chefs that I had while I was there and picking their brains and like pushing them to push me um, and competitions you know, uh, just really having the courage to compete during culinary school when you really don't know anything, but, you know, just for the experience and signing up for things, you know, I, uh, I think one of the reasons why I was able to go so far in my career so quickly was because, you know, I took advantage of, of competitions, of events, you know, If there was a food and wine event and they needed volunteers, I was volunteering. Mm -hmm. You know, if a butcher needed an assistant, I was there assisting, you know, whatever it was just to get more um, knowledge, I was doing it. But also, you know, along the way, you meet people, if if you're lucky, you know, you meet people, chefs who will who will help you and who will guide you and who will train you and will mentor you. And I was very fortunate to have um, not one, but two really good, solid mentors who helped me on my journey that I could call them and ask them questions. And, you know, they would help me and uh, just continuing to push and really continuing to believe that I could make this uh, a career for myself. Um, it isn't uh, super glamorous. And I mean, in, 19, in 2001, I think I was making like $9 an hour, $8 an hour. And I was working two jobs, you know, and I worked two jobs right after culinary school. Like I worked two jobs so that I could get double the experience. And because I did that, I worked at two really great restaurants. And because I did that, 
um, I was able to move up the ladder very quickly. And then uh, I, you know, whenever there was a restaurant that I wanted to work at that was, had a job opening, I would apply. Mm -hmm. Even though I might not have been experienced enough or may not have been what they were looking for, you know, just to get some FaceTime with the executive chef. And, you know, they would be like, you know what? You might not have the experience, but you will have the experience. You know, I will bring you on. So there was a lot of that going on, like really having to go for it. Um, I really took advantage of any slight crack in the door being open, of pushing it open um, and getting in there. That's great. Thank you so much, Michelle. And Cindy, yep. uh, Chef Cindy, same question is, I want to know what kind of opportunities did you take advantage of along in your journey as a, as a chef? You know, thank you. And Michelle, I, I agree with you 100%. That's exactly what I did. However, I started um, back in retail. So um, I was a bakery manager for grocery stores and I ran the deli. And so I kind of had a little foot in already um, right out of high school. So I came out of retail and I was there for a very long time, like 10 years, but I just loved food and I loved being in a kitchen. And, you know, you, you have to have a passion for this. You know, I worked every weekend, I worked every holiday mm -hmm. and um, I didn't mind, you know, it was okay. I put in the hours because I, um, you know, I loved what I was doing, you know, frying donuts and eating a hot donut out of the fryer every day. What more could you ask for? Um, so I started in retail and then I went back to school because I wanted to be a little bit more creative and I wanted to learn more technique at that time. And like Michelle said, you know, I volunteered for everything, you know, my culinary school, you know, we catered for the president. Um, I catered for the Oscars a couple years and just all of that, you know, I just took it in and, um, you know, I put in a lot of hours and, uh, it served me well. Um, and I found what, uh, what I really love to do. And so, um, you know, that's what you have to do is um, find something you love and put in the hours because then it's not a job, right? It's a passion. And I work my passion every day. And I'm blessed that I get to share my passion with students and pay it forward. And I encourage them to do the same thing. Find out what you're good at. Do you like baking or do you like the savory side? Maybe you like the wine. Maybe you want to be a wine steward. You know what I mean? And, and right now is the time for them to explore. And we encourage them. We, that's why we have um, the restaurant open here at school so that students can get a real world experience on what it's like to cook for people, serve for people, talk to people, you know, see where your guests are at. And so, um, yeah, just taking advantage of, of all the opportunities and um, saying yes, just say yes. Uh, as a follow up to that, uh, something with these clips, uh, they mentioned all these different types of like kitchens and things you could do outside of school. But I wanted to ask you in particular, Cindy, if uh, I've seen more community college now that offer culinary school. And so I know it's more accessible than it has been because I know when I was looking into my undergrad, I thought about culinary school and I looked at the price tag and I was like, nope, I can't. Like, <laughs> that's that's a lot. I, mean, I was trying to find another way, but back then there really wasn't. And so I uh, wanted to get your perspective on how like chefs are trained now. It's like the, in, in your training of the future chefs. So it's like, how has that training changed in the last years, few years, maybe? You know, um, that's a great question. You know, we here at the community college, there's uh, probably a dozen community colleges in California that have culinary programs now. And, um, you know, instead of it being fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year, Chef Michelle, I don't know what you paid, but here it's $5,000 and you can get your associate's degree. And we have um, the instructors from Cordon Bleu here teaching at the community college. So it's the same education, if not better. Um, our chefs are still in industry. As you know, one of our chefs owns a restaurant, another owns a catering company, another is a pastry chef. So we have, all of us instructors, have real world experience to pass on. And you only take one or two classes at a time. You don't have to sign up for the whole program. A lot of students, you know, they get in it and they're like, man, I didn't realize how hard this was. 
Well, you're only in it for a couple thousand dollars. You're not in it for you have to stay, you know, for and get your 50,000 or $60,000 worth. So um, I think um, it's the best way to go if you're not sure if you want to be in culinary. If you're sure, it's a, it's a great way to hone your skills, um, you know, and, and connect with other culinarians, right? Like we have students who now went off and did their own thing and have hired other students, right? Because they're all connected in that culinary community. And that's so awesome to see. So I would encourage everybody start at a community college, you know, and uh, we've had students that um, have earned their scholarships to like the CIA, the Culinary Institute of America, which is by far, and I'm sure Chef Michelle will agree with me, uh, the best culinary school, uh, bang for your buck. Um, we've had students uh, that have gotten scholarships after they've completed our program and it just put them on another level. So, um, yeah. So oh, thank you for that. And then, so my, my next question then after the clip is like, I feel like, um, uh, the, the chef that did the, I keep going back to that donut, that, <laughs> the Hawaiian donut. And she's like, she had like this aha moment. And I'm, I'm wondering what was your aha moment where you feel like you discovered maybe your signature as a chef, or do you feel like you you have a signature as a chef? So those are the two. So maybe what is your signature and how, what was your aha moment? You're like, this is it. This is my thing. Michelle, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. Um... <laughs> I still don't know how to answer that. I've been cooking for 22 years and I really, I still go through phases. Mm. I get really obsessed with, you know, I went through a pickle phase for almost a year and I pickled everything. Like every season I was pickling and canning to find the right texture, flavor, acidity level for ev almost every single vegetable. And I get these obsessive, streaks because <laughs> it's it's a sickness um I get these really big obsessive streaks and for that period of time I'm like pickling is my signature or braising is my signature and I put it on everything and I'm pickling it and it's all of my dishes have something pickled or I mean I went through a braising phase and like you know everything has some sort of braise or you know, I went through like almost a two year smoking phase where I smoked everything, flour, butter, jams, meats, veggies, and, and all different kinds of woods, cold smoke, hot smoke, like everything, you name it, um, you know, just to see what it was. So for me, um, I can't say that I really have one, you know, dish that's my signature, but I definitely do have like this uh, hunger and passion for food and like how things work and how flavors work and how technique affects texture. Um, you can, uh, you know, people who have had my food can generally tell my food because it's so layered. So um, that is definitely a signature technique of mine. You know, I, if I'm doing like a coursed meal, um, if I start with beets, I also end with beets and have it throughout every dish. Um, you know, five courses, there's some sort of beet component in every dish, um, you know, or cheese or whatever it may be. But my flavors uh, layer and they build to the entree and then I take it back down to a mellow for dessert. Um, so that if, you know, it's not any specific dish, it's more of a technique and or style of cooking that is my signature. And that that's really what it would be because I really go through phases um, when it comes to food and whatever phase I'm in, that's gonna be my signature. Like right now I'm going through a foam phase. I went through this phase a few years ago, but now I'm back in this foam phase where I want to foam everything and I'm putting it on everything so um you know anything that I'm making right now has some sort of foam on it and that's my signature right now but always in that same layer situation that's great thank you yep Cindy 
Yeah, I, I'll agree with Michelle. I kind of, um, you know, go in and out of phases. And of course, right now, my phase is sourdough bread. I have a starter. I love Mastata. Uh, he's seven years old. And um, yeah, I'm into the sourdough bread, into the rolls. Um, I love working with yeast right now. Um, so yeah, I've gone through phases too. Uh, I used to, um, a couple of years ago, um, we did a lot of catering parties here um, uh, on campus and I make a really great chocolate sushi. So, and everybody loved that. And they're like, oh, chef, you got a chocolate sushi. So um, yeah, but, but like Michelle said, we, I go through phases too, but I make a mean sourdough. I wish I could have it. <laughs> I wish you guys were here. <laughs> I went, we've been, I've been working on like breads and I like import uh, flour from Italy. And I, my boyfriend's gotten really good at making me bread. And I'm like, this is great. This is better than anything I buy in the store. So that's I'm happy. Great. I also think I'm starting to forget what real bread tastes like, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I enjoy what's, what's being made. Um, but thank you for that. My next question is actually, it's still a part of the, the chef's journey. So I want to know, what are some like key transitional moments in your career that you can maybe highlight? And if you've chased uh, or if you had any challenges as a chef and as a female chef in particular, um, anything about that that you want to share with us? Do you want me to go first? Uh, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. All right. So um, challenges as a female chef in the kitchen. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the kitchen is tight quarters. And, you know, some kitchens are, you know, the size of a six foot table and others in big hotels are a little bit, you know what I mean? You have a, a room uh, being a pastry chef, but um, absolutely. And, you know, you just have to, um, you know, keep a good head on your shoulders and speak your mind and understand the pecking order. Right. And um, you just keep your head down and do your thing. Uh, there's been a few instances, but, you know, I've kept on and, um, you know, it's different. Uh, the energy in a kitchen when it's all men is very, very different from an energy uh, when there's a few women in the kitchen. And you can ask any restaurant owner and that's the truth. So, um, yeah, there's been instances, but, you know, I speak my mind and I speak up for myself and I keep my head down and, um, you know, I do the best work that I could do. Um, and then my aha moment. I've had a few. I've had quite a few, you know, um, I've been doing this for a very long time. So uh, my favorite aha moment uh, I'll share with everybody. And there's lots and there's a lot of memories and kitchen stories and um, just a, a wealth of really great memories. My favorite one is um, I made my famous chocolate sushi. I used to work for a catering company called Smashbox. It's in Culver City and um, they did commercial shoots. They did photo shoots, Annie Leibowitz and um, Cosmopolitan and all the big mags would go there for their photo shoots. And um, I ran the pastry kitchen and um, lo and behold, George Clooney was doing a commercial there. And I uh, walked in the room uh, with my um, plate full of chocolate sushi and my knees buckled and um, I wrote my phone number in chocolate on the plate and he hasn't called me yet. But that was an aha moment, <laughs> like, wow, I can really, you know, it's I can box. hang here. Yeah, <laughs> it was a great memory. And Chef Michelle, anything, any challenges you faced as a chef, as a female chef? That is awesome. I want that memory. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I started in kitchens in 1999 and I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't really know, uh, you know, that this was a career, you know, in El Salvador, uh, being a chef is like being a maid. So I didn't really realize that this was a career until um, culinary school. But in uh, kitchens and just, you know, just like you said, it's, you know, six foot area kitchen everything's really tight and you know it's hot and everyone's yelling at you and you're trying to feed you know 200 people at a time make make everything perfect every time and when you work in a fine dining um uh kitchen it's different 
there is a big difference I feel between a uh, regular, and what I mean by regular restaurant, I mean a non-fine dining kitchen restaurant. So like a regular restaurant, like, you know, like Fridays or Chili's or um, a mom and pop, you know, restaurant, as opposed to, you know, like Melise or the Rose or whatever fine dining restaurant, the caliber of technique that's needed for a fine dining restaurant is different. So um, the culture is different. So I have found that at casual dining restaurants, it's a little bit more rough around the edges for women and you don't get treated as well and you definitely don't get paid as much. Um, when you move into a fine dining restaurant, uh, I feel like the respect level is there. It's still very competitive, super competitive, but it's not as rough. And uh, there's a little bit more opportunity. It's still very competitive, competitive but um, it's a little bit nicer. Um, and as far as aha moments or, you know, challenges throughout and I feel like every time I made a jump from you know casual dining to fine dining or a corporate restaurant to non-corporate restaurant you know it's always had taken that leap of faith of you know this is going to be great it's going to be a good experience whether it is or it isn't it's just having that faith that you know it's everything is going to work out um and when for me, being in fine dining was that aha moment when I realized that food could really change lives and food could really change, you know, culture and dynamic and farming practices. I learned that in fine dining. And that was my aha moment when I realized that I was in the right space. I was like, this is where I'm meant to be. This is what I want to do. And I'm so happy that I'm doing it. Thank you. And I think that leaves nice or leads into nicely into my next clip that I have. It's just, this is the last clip. Um, should be a, about four minutes or so. And it's a clip from Restaurant Providence here in Hollywood. Uh, and it's a, the story of two brothers that one was raised here in the US, the other one came from Guatemala. And um, I'll let the, the clip speak for itself, but I wanted to just preface that a little bit. So we are going into a little bit of the fine dining world right now. My grandma was the, she's the one who always will make like really good food and uh, that's my inspiration. Chef Mike goes like, make the best, like, bum ass sauce you ever made. So, yes. Chir Morning, what's Chir Morning? It's a Mayan word. It means uh, running nose. I started like charring all these tomatoes, onions, cilantro, meat. My grandma, she never left no recipe, so I tried to like find that taste and try to remember her. She might go try that, and she's like, this is really awesome, this is good. It's this great salsa that the more you taste it, the more you love it. And eventually I asked George to make a more refined version to use on our menu, because it's just so delicious, and there's so many things you can do with it. So we're, we're going to cook them for 15 seconds. I was discussing with George, like, if you were going to serve the chermol at home, and by at home I mean Guatemala, with a protein, what would you serve it with? And he said, um, if it was going to be fish or shellfish, it would definitely be shrimp. So that's why we went with shrimp. To give it more of a local flavor, we we're using spot prawns from Santa Barbara. And I think we're super fortunate to be here in Southern California, be able to access them throughout the season. So it was, it was basically, it was the first course that guests would get here. It was the backbone of the dish. And so George was very proud when, when it made it to the menu. Yeah, it was, it was great. The difference between me and George, I was living in the States at the time, and my brother was living in Guatemala. They have a very big gang problem over there. 
So he'll tell me, oh, this, I got beat up, or they try to beat me up, or they try to rob me. You would have, like, gang members right outside of the school, and the inside of the school want you to jump in or want to beat you up outside. So it was either being with them or being against them. I, it's just, it's sad. You know, hearing about my brother struggling, and I'm here living comfortable, and while he's over there trying to just survive. Now he's a father to two young boys, and you know, he's had his struggles and he's had his issues over the years. I can't imagine this place without him. He's as valuable to his restaurant as any of the other chefs, and he has a sense of ownership and pride about what he does. He just pushes every day, pushes himself, pushes the people around him so that he meets like his own very high standard for what he does. And, and that's, I don't know, you, can't, you really can't ask for more than that. It's a story of long odds, it's a story of violence, it's a story of getting kicked out of a place that you know and love. They wound up in Los Angeles. They wound up in a town that's booming for some and it's hard grinding work for a lot of others. So let's say I took all the bad stuff from one of my life, bring it here, and just switch them, just like flip them, make something positive with it. And that's how I believe I have a good fire from Pro Wrestling. Just like putting your heart and putting everything you have and like do your job. And I'm still working on it. That was that clip. And one of the things I really like about this is it, it shows inspiration. And so it shows that, you know, George is inspired by his grandmother and the cooking that influence a, a dish and Providence is fine dine restaurant. But another part of this clip that now uh, this story that we didn't see is that his younger brother, who is actually very tall, a lot taller than he is, uh, he was actually, he talks about he's inspired by his brother and his journey and what he's done and how, how he's so proud of what he does in this restaurant every day. And so with this clip, I wanted to kind of bring it to you is, is what inspires you today. And I know both of you um, have done some sort of teaching. It's like, what uh, or how are you inspiring your students in this field? So one is internal, like how are you inspired to continue every day and do what you do, but also how are you inspiring the next generation of chefs? Uh, anyone, I guess, uh, Chef Cindy, you wanna go first? Yeah. Sure. Um, what inspires me? Um, I am inspired by uh, good food. I'm inspired by farmers markets. I'm inspired by healthy food. And, um, you know, I haven't been to a McDonald's in 30 years now. And I just don't like to eat that way anymore. You know, I don't go to a drive through and I'm very lucky that I can cook, you know, for my family and feel comfortable doing so. And, and knowing that it's fresh, nutritious, and it's healthy and it's good for your body. So that inspires me. And, um, you know, going back to my sourdough bread and, and, and feeding the starter once a week and, you know, getting the good flour and getting the good butter to put on that bread. That inspires me because I like to eat that way. You know what I mean? I like to have good food. And, you know, the students inspire me every day. They will tell me, oh my gosh, those rolls we made, my grandma loved them. Um, you know, the, the crepes we made the other day, chef, I made them for my family and they loved them. And so, you know, just hearing their stories and what they've learned from me and now they're taking it to their families, like the clip just said. And it's just so rewarding. It really, really is. So that's what inspires me now. Thank you very much. Uh, chef Michelle. Hey, um, so there are so many things that inspire me, really, but I think it boils down to flavor. I love flavor <laughs> and, <laughs> and I love mixing it up and like just making things up. And to me, um, you know, it's, it's very cooking to me is very meditative. You know, I will get home after, you know, 14 hours of cooking and make something. I live with my mom. 
And my mom will tell me, aren't you tired of cooking? <laughs> and I'm just like, no, I can't, I can't get enough of it. Um, but, you know, flavor really inspires me. And also my family. I really love hearing stories about, you know, family and, and you know, life in El Salvador and, you know, the food that they made and, uh, you know, like they were saying about, you know, how he was saying about his grandmother, you know, none of the recipes were written down, yeah. you know, and same, same here, you know, none of the recipes that I grew up with were written down. So I do really like to spend time, I call them food memories. And um, I kind of just like meditate on it and like, think about what those flavors are, and what the texture was and how they taste and how they make me feel. And I really try to replicate that in whatever it is that I make. So um, food memories inspire me and just like flavor, like making things pop. You know, I really want things to just be delicious. Um, and, you know, how I'm inspiring others. I mean, I hope people, I mean, I work with a lot of students through CCAP and my mentees, of course, but, you know, my main focus with my mentees and when I do lectures is to really, you know, and vibe and encourage um, youth and students to find what it is that keeps them going, that keeps them up at night, that whatever it is that makes them tick and to find that and to use that and to harness that power to, you know, to do good, to cook, you know, whatever it is, if it's accounting, if it's cooking, architecture, whatever it is, but really use it and really dig into it and, and feed it, you know, feed that passion um, and, and, and get in it, you know, live in it. Um, I truly try to encourage my mentees to do that, you know, and if it's food, great, volunteer, go to farmer's markets, eat as much as you can, try things, mess things up, burn some stuff, you know, make some things that are great because it's all learning, you know, whether good or bad, you know, it's all learning experience. Okay, thank you for that. I have two more questions and then we'll open it up for, I think I saw some questions in the chat. So I'll, I'll try to hurry with my questions. <laughs> so the, the next one is, uh, how has the food industry changed in the last year? I know the food industry has gone through a lot of transitions and, and maybe how do you see food culture in LA transitioning going forward? Um, so it's, it's hard to say now because, you know, everything is just now opening up. Uh, what we're finding here is that people don't want to leave. So they'll have their dinner and they're so happy to be around, you know, other people that they sit at the table for longer. Um, which is, you know, good and bad in both ways. And I find that people want to have a good experience with customer service. They want to know that you're safe, you know, that your restaurant or whatever, um, you know, however you're preparing your food, you know, is safe and uh, you follow all the, the sanitation and the protocol now. And, um, you know, food is very expensive now and the food shortages are a big problem. We sometimes don't get a delivery um, because, you know, the truck driver, you know, called in or, you know, um, they just don't have enough people to drive and deliver. Um, so it's changing um, a little bit uh, in the sense that you have to be mindful of those things on your menu. You know, you can't offer lobster now because you can't get a lobster. Or if you get a lobster, you're going to have to charge $250 a pound for it. And people aren't going to pay that, you know, so... I think that um, as consumers, as guests, you know, you have to give the restaurants just a little bit of leeway, you know, trying to maneuver this new world right now that we're in. Um, as far as, uh, well, yeah, I mean, catering and I have a lot of friends who own restaurants and I think the biggest shift that is being seen and felt um, restaurants at least on this side of town <clears throat> is um mental health in the kitchen and really you know 
for a long time, you know, cooks or people in the restaurant industry worked, you know, eight hours, nine hours, 10 hours straight, you know, without any breaks, you know, you can't have water on the line, you know, things like that or whatever. And I think there's been a real awakening and a real check of, you know, how are you treating your employees? And I think HR is a really big change that restaurants are seeing. And the treatment of their employees is very huge, retaining employees. Um, you know, I feel like that dynamic um, is in a big uh, flux as far as service is concerned. Um, you know, I think takeaway or delivery is definitely here to stay. And I think you're going to see a lot more higher end restaurants doing um, takeaway and or takeaway experiences um, because there's just not enough room in their restaurant, you know, to accommodate, you know, given new laws and guidelines and whatnot. So that's what I see in restaurants recently. I agree. And it's hard to hold on to people. You know, people now don't want to go work, you know, 12, 14 hours a day. And um, it's hard to, you know, you'll get, you know, people, some restaurants um, are hiring and you'll get 15 applications and one person will show up for the interview. So um, it's very, very difficult to find good help now. And that good help that you have, you're asking more of them now um, because, you know, uh, there's nobody else to do the, the tasks. So it's, it's quite a transition. And on the flip side for our students and for anybody that wants to go into hospitality, the restaurant industry, um, the opportunities are wide open right now, much more so than um, when I started um, because everybody's looking for people and it's a great opportunity to get your foot in the door somewhere. So that's, that's what I think and I've seen. I totally agree with that statement that it is a great opportunity for people to get into restaurants right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That actually leads into, which I think you already touched on this a little bit. It's my last question is, what is something we might not know about the food industry as consumers and how can we help to improve it? The food industry people and hospitality industry people work hard. They work weekends. They're on their feet 12, 14 hours a day. They work all holidays. Mm -hmm. Treat them well. Tip well. Don't be, you know what I mean? Um, all offended because, you know, your roll was only two ounces instead of two and a half ounces or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, be kind, be kind to your server um, and be kind to each other, actually. But um, that would be my takeaway is, you know, they're working hard. They are working hard. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yes, please treat them well. Tip them. Yes. Um, Gosh, I think one of the things that a lot of people aren't aware that is starting to come to light is, uh, or they're aware, but it's just not talked about, is the stress levels inside of restaurants and that how that affects a person's body. Mm -hmm. um, you know, something that people may not be aware about is you're expected to create uh, I mean, someone's going to come in and they're going to pay $25 or $35 for a steak. And you're one lonely person working on a station, let's say grill, for example, you're going to have 50, you know, anywhere between 10 and 30 steaks at a time coming off that one station. And you're expected to make them all look perfect, taste perfect, and plate them within a 10 minute window. You know, if you just think about that, if you just think about that for one second, like the amount of stress and heat and everything, and that's not even side dishes, which, you know, is like two, you know, what potatoes, greens and whatever, you know, three things that you need to get out in 10 minutes, but it's not just one, you're getting out, you know, 25 of them at a time. You know, I feel like people don't really realize all of the work that's going into making that one dish and it doesn't start at the kitchen it starts one dish started six months ago at some guy's farm 
with one seed or a cow, you know? And then, so every single dish took, you know, anywhere from, you know, a minimum of four months to a year to make, if you're looking at it that way. People don't think about that. Thank you very much, Fess. So now that was that was my last question, and I want to save some time to open it up for questions from um, the audience. And I know there's been some in the chat, so if those that wrote down the questions want to unmute themselves and ask, that, feel free. If not, I can always just read the question. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> so other, <coughs> I'll read the first question. Um, so it says, uh, urban areas seem to create the melting pot, like Michelle mentioned. But living in urban environments is expensive and food work, uh, food work doesn't pay well. Is that an issue in the industry that the industry talks about? I think you all, oh, you actually, you already mentioned that a little bit. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that. Sure. I mean, it's really difficult. So for restaurant, uh, just, I don't know if anybody, if you guys know or not, but like a restaurant generally makes 5% and that's a good restaurant makes 5% profit. So like, think about that. And then, um, you know, if you're only making, you know, you're putting a dollar in and you're only making, you know, a dollar and 50 cents or a dollar and 10 cents back, a dollar or five back. That's a lot of work for five cents. Um, but uh, it's hard. They're trying. I know a lot of restaurants out there are trying to pay their staff more. Um, you know, when you pay your staff more, then that means you have to charge more for the price of food. And, you know, people, depending on the area, can't necessarily afford that. So that is definitely a hot topic. You're not alone, but catering generally pays a little bit better um, than restaurant work because they don't have as much overhead. So if you're trying to look for a job that's gonna pay you well um, and you wanna cook, try catering and may not be consistent, but you know, you'll get paid 20, $25 an hour. Whereas in a restaurant, you know, you'll get paid, uh, I think it's like 13, between 13 and 16 an hour, which is still pretty good, I think, um, for a restaurant to pay staff. Uh, it just depends. I think hotels pay the most, but it's really hard to get in. Thank you. I do have, let's see, I have another uh, question. It says, uh, food trucks are now all over the suburbs, which is great. Uh, have food trucks changed the acceptance of food and perhaps with it, the acceptance of the people from those regions of the world? I think so. I think that um, people are more apt to try something different on a food truck. It's like a little adventure. You know what I mean? Like, oh, let's try this. Oh, let's try that. Uh, and it's much more acceptable now, um, I feel, than it was 10 years ago. So um, I think the food truck scene is great. Um, I think it's going to be around for a little bit longer, uh, for sure. I hope it stays around forever because I love a good food truck. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and um mm -hmm. you know i think it's i i feel like food truck people are a whole different breed of cooks and yeah. they are hard working there is i feel like there are very few people as hard working as a food truck owner um but you know you're right i feel like people are more open to try things on a food truck because it is a little adventure and it has opened a lot of doors for different cultures and usually inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you remember how the, what they call the locheras, the food trucks, where that's something that even um, my mom would talk about when she worked in a factory downtown somewhere as a seamstress. And that, that's where they would get lunch. It was a food truck. And it was always something, usually Mexican food. Uh, but now it's like how that's changed so much and how there's so much diversity in the food trucks. I think I'm um, like, I personally think it's great because it is cheaper to get someone going in the industry, but it's also, it's, we're just exposed to more. It's easier for us to get access to different types of foods as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also yeah. hope that they're here to stay. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and let me see. Um, I have a couple more questions, so let me look through, make sure I get. Um, oh, this is, I think, that's a good one. It's probably, it's very relevant to the transitions in the last year and a half. Has there been a change in food safety expectations? Oh my yeah. God, yes. One <laughs> hundred. <laughs> What are some of those? I mean, I'm assuming there's also challenges with the food safety expectations now, even just to operate. Can you tell us a little bit about that. So, um, you know, for us, you know, we have uh, an instructor that owns a restaurant and, you know, um, they expect the restaurant to be clean. Uh, the, everybody has to wear a mask. There's sanitizer on the, um, on the tables, you know, and so, um, you know, when it's food to go, all the packaging, um, for the to goes is very expensive. So, um, yeah, I think it's heightened sense a little bit. We are ready um, here in LA. We're mandated by the um, health department anyway. You know, they come in and they give you a grade, uh, which I am all for. But now uh, people do expect, you know, that they see it being sanitized. They see the chefs wearing gloves, you know, when they're cooking. And so, yeah, I think it's changed quite a bit. And I think that will stay. I, yeah, all of the things, um, you know, as a catering has changed as well. So yeah, I've had my company for four years. So since COVID, I mean, I've definitely have to put in new practices in place, not just for service, but also for my staff. Like everyone needs to be vaccinated. Everyone needs to, um, I do a lot of, I do studio work in like galas. So anytime, you know, we do a galas or we're going into a studio, um, my staff needs to get tested to make sure that they're not sick 48 hours before um, the event, my larger events. Um, you know, that's, I'd never had to deal with that before. They all have to sign waivers now. Um, yeah. I, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely different. I have to keep a lot more records um, and then also just the cleaning and the sanitizing as well. Um, you know, we have protocols, you know, every 30 minutes, you have to do this every hour, you have to do this, you know, you have to, and because of that, you have to have more people on staff. So it's, it's, it's changing, but you know, it's needed. Yeah. So I'm not upset about it. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I think we have maybe uh, time for one more and then we'll wrap up. We also have a, a short poll to go through, but I wanted to let's see one more question here that we've been talking about LA is like a melting pot of different cultures, different techniques in, in the food and how it's kind of shaped what the food industry is here in the food culture. And so this question here says that, you know, in the US, we have completely new kinds of food being invented, and they kind of stick around in the culture. And is this something that happens everywhere? Or are most places outside the US sticking to tradition? Is there something that you can talk about, maybe? I, I haven't been out of the US now for four or five years. So I really can't speak of what's going on, you know, outside of what we're doing. I imagine it's similar. I imagine it's similar to what we're doing. You know, it really depends, honestly. Um, it really depends on the area and the way, um, and immigration and the way that people are immigrating to other countries, you know, in Mexico, Mexico City um, has a really big our, um, Iranian uh, group of people. And so what is you're seeing a lot now or more often is Iranian and Mexican um, mashup, which is really great and um, unexpected. Like who would have thought that in a million years? Um, <laughs> me, um, you know, but also I see a lot of people from the U.S. traveling to other countries to, you know, to cook with chefs in other countries and like, you know, talk and, you know, explore cuisines. So I definitely think it's happening. I think the more metropolitan um, the city is, the more variety of cuisine that you will have. 
in general. Yeah, I think I agree with that. And I personally visit Mexico most and I go to Mexico City and you can find like a gastro pub kind of like you can here. That's like, and now I see more um, so in Mexico, a lot of the beers are very light, uh, but now you see the kind of like breweries that are popping up and I've seen them more like in um, Ensenada area. So Northern California, like the closer you are to the US, it's like people that go back and forth. They have that mm -hmm. experience of kind of like the, I call them the fancier burgers or the, the gastro pubs kind of thing. And so I've seen them pop up more and more um, down up until like Puerto Vallarta area. And so it's, it's part of it, I think it's catering to those coming in from the US, but it's also like, it's, you know, they've experienced it. So they want it there as well. That's just one example that I've seen, but I can tell you in my, in my personal travels, I did see um, kind of like the, the, what we have here is American Chinese food. I saw it uh, all over Europe and that was kind of my comfort food away from home. If I couldn't have tacos and I was like, well, I'm going to go have some Chinese food in France or in Spain or whatever. And that was kind of like, oh, it's kind of like home. Uh, so I have seen kind of those pop up different places. And it, I think it does influence because it's not the same. It's not like American Chinese food. It's like a Spanish Chinese food or that version. It's like you're using local ingredients to try to create the similar flavors, um, even though it might not be the same what you would get in China. But I thought that was also very interesting. You can tell who's who's there. I mean, right in the metropolitan areas, there's more variety of different foods, at least from, from what I've seen. We'll see in the next um, uh, once travel opens up again more and we start moving around, see what that, that looks like going forward. Um. <laughs> Good point, Sob. <laughs> I think we have something like, yeah, who thought about putting avocado and sushi? Is that not normal? Like, that's amazing. It's a California thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the California roll. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It was invented in Los Angeles, a California roll, and now the avocado everywhere. We have avocados here. So, uh, and I think, yeah, we're getting close to time, and I wanted to do a quick poll. Uh, I just want to see if there's anyone else I wanted to say, like, uh, have any questions, one more, maybe one more question from the audience. You can mute yourself and ask if you'd like. Got a bit of a shy bunch. It's okay. We're online. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Just speak up. Well, I'd like to invite everybody here for um, a meal at some time. It would be great to see everybody at a table. Uh, we'll be open again in spring um, for our lunch program. Uh, we'll be open on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, you can go on College of the Canyons and their culinary and make a reservation. And I know Saab, you've been here and um, Ruth, Matthew. you've been here. So thank you for the support. Uh, Michelle, please come and visit and tour and I'd love to meet you in person. I am totally going. I'm excited <laughs> for the spring. Yes. <laughs> come on campus, Michelle. And I also wanted to point out, Michelle, um, your Dia de los Muertos that just passed the event. Dia de los Muertos event that just passed. You do that, I know, every year. And that's a great yeah. event. And I want to make sure people know about it and look out for it next year. And I'm sure there's other stuff going on. Um, you can also follow Chef Michelle online and find out what's what's in store, what she's up to. Oh, thanks, babe. <laughs> Dia de los Muertos is my favorite. Um, yes. I'm looking for a venue. If anybody knows a venue, I'm looking for a bigger place next year. Um, you know, this is... Next year will be my fifth year doing it. I'm turning five. It'll be my fifth year. So I really want to do something spectacular. But what's a little different about it is that, you know, traditionally the other Los Muertos is celebrated in Mexico and I'm Salvadoran and American. So it's all three of them together. Mm. And um, it's a melting pot of music and food and, you know, storytelling. And it's just a lot of fun. Sounds wonderful. And before everyone goes, I'm like, thank you for that again. Thank you for panels. Thank you for those who were here. Um, really enjoyed the questions and I hope you had a good time learning about the food industry and what's coming up. I know we all love food, so we, it's good to know more about what's going on in the industry. And I want to do a quick poll. Okay, that's good. That's the end of the poll. 
Once again, thank you so much for coming. And I want to plug some of our events going on tomorrow. So tomorrow at 11, we have uh, admin perspectives on intercultural policies and programs. We also have a study abroad panel at 2 p.m. And then at this same time tomorrow, we're going to have uh, mentoring learners beyond the formal. And that's a uh, um, a scholar that's uh, zooming in from Nepal so that we have a different perspectives going on. So like I said, today we had LGBTQ panel, now we're food, tomorrow we're moving on to intercultural, international and then perspectives. So please stick around if you like this, continue to see what's going on the rest of the week. We'd love to have you back. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye, have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was really wonderful. Thank you for making it. <laughs>